Okay, and we are recording now live, and it's perhaps appropriate that the first person I interview on my paddle shanties um, feature is my own my own son, my own flesh and blood. <laughs> so good morning, good morning to you, Henry Smith. Um, good morning, good morning. Uh, like I say, you you. As well as everybody else, I mean, you've been a dragon boater. You are still dragon boat and such, but you've moved on now to other other things. And I just wanted to sort of recap, not so much your history in dragon boating, short though spectacular though it was, but also what that has actually given you. Yeah, because what we, we we don't have yep. too many people. Um, we do have lots of youths and lots of successful youths actually doing the sport in the UK and worldwide, but not that many people go on because they find other challenges. So firstly, just just uh, I know this obviously because I'm your father, but just for the for the benefit of the viewers, how did you, Henry Smith? If I know, firstly, tell me about yourself. What are you up to now? That's more more interesting. I mean, what are you up to now? <laughs> Where are so, you in, in the world and in your life? Uh, currently, just about to finish my third year of my four year biochemistry degree at the University wow. of Nottingham. Yeah. Um, uh, competing canoe polo, I'm the men's captain of the, the Nottingham canoe polo team, um, which is very much a step to the side from dragon boating. It's something different, but still obviously staying on the, the topic of water sports. Um, yeah, at the moment I'm, I'm I've just finished my my third year dissertation. I'm coming out to my my technically finals exams for my first three years, and uh, I'm looking forward to to those being done. But um, apart from that, trying to enjoy the lockdown, trying to be um trying to stay fit trying to stay active and yeah. get a good balance of, of everything but, uh, it's yeah. quite interesting what you say there because i'm of the same mind i mean nobody wishes uh the current restrictions and all the the complications and problems that causes but people are sort of um turning their minds yeah i believe and you know i believe necessity is a mother of invention so if you find yourself in a difficult corner or something unexpected then you'll make the most of it so when you say yeah. i mean a lot of people yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, are suffering and that, that's to be understood and respected but also there's a lot of people finding some new opportunities so they're actually they're yeah, yeah. working quite hard uh myself included um out and about doing stuff and i'm when i say i'm enjoying the lockdown i'm enjoying it because I'm, i've got another opportunity to do things like this things i've wanted to do for yeah enjoy enjoying aspects of it yeah rather than i get that also. so um i appreciate the, the the way with you university the uh, the way they're going to do exams is different this year and that's one new uh, new ground perhaps i'll sort of carry on some of those procedures but just tell us a bit about yeah. um your kayak or canoe polo because that's going quite well isn't it i know you were sort of uh, been, been doing it for a few years now so so where are you in terms of the national ranking for would you say it's canoe polo? It's because kayaks, isn't it? Is it canoe polo or kayak polo? Is it correct? So it, 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 we call it canoe polo over in the UK, um, but technically it is kayak polo just due to the nature of the boats and the paddles you use and that sort of thing. Um, but then when you go over to Eastern European countries, they call it kayak polo or right. kayak polo is, is the, the term they use for it. But um, yeah, canoe, canoe polo here is sort of a, a, com a common, sort of like a, an error. In in, uh, in in the name, but it's uh, the same sort of thing, and it's a team sport. Um, five players based around yeah, passing, shooting. It, it's very much a tactical game, opposed to well, which is which made it a very different step towards that from coming to, from coming from dragon boating. So, right. I mean, it's interesting because uh, long before I've been I've been paddling boats um for best part of 35 40 years and i would say if, even before i got into dragon boating which is technically a canoe or outrigger which is technically a canoe i would say i'm going canoeing when in fact i'm going kayaking so i think in the uk yeah and in yeah, fact, yeah. the canoe union now british uh, canoeing is kayaking as well so i think in the uk there's that sort yeah. of uh, yeah that just sort of they're merged merged together yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's the same thing okay fine well that's 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 good thank you for that so how did you as a young lad first get involved in the sport of dragon boating how did that happen so what was it? must be 2010 2011 um i was part of the local scout group second thorpe scouts near me and um we were they offered to, then, to yeah. they started it all we're basically basically yeah we're basically offered to to 
to complete the dragon boating badge so you know you get all the badges on your arm and that sort of thing so they're the specific one for dragon boating which no one had ever heard of of course but um so we all got the opportunity to take part in that which involved a bit of training and then uh like a race day like a small charity corporate race thing at marlow um which we all competed in it was great fun like we uh um i think the majority of the group enjoyed it by the looks of it and, and i was very much very much into it and, and i liked the idea of working within the team and that sort of thing and, and that that uh really worked for me in a sense uh so from then on it progressed very quickly in a sense that got involved in the local club which at the, well still is raised with dragons but at the time combined with bristol to make tail dragons yes oh yes um, and that that was very much a quick stepping stone on to like moving from the well, a very small part of the corporate scene onto the the more local regional national level scene where you're actually competing at events and things and it was like I said, it was it progressed very quickly into becoming like the team drummer. So obviously three parts of Dragon, but three main parts. You've got the drummer, the paddlers, and the helm, and the steerer. And um, yeah, I, I I really enjoyed getting involved in the competition aspect straight away. That very much appealed to me because yeah. I've always been uh, quite a competitive person within sport. So when I was younger, I did a lot of sports and art school activities but the one I really focused on then was trampolining so oh yes that, of course yes, sort of yes. thing. yeah so that was I don't remember when I started but I, I did four or five years of that and at national level and that sort of thing I think I finished around 2013 which is it was quite a natural progression from sort of taking up dragon boating around 2011 starting to compete starting to get into the team sports side of um competition and that sort of thing and that sort of took over from the trampolining side a little bit and it was quite quite a smooth transition because for quite a while obviously a few years I was doing both and like most kids that age that's the sort of age you get to where you have to start deciding what you want to do you can't do everything because I was, I was doing trampolining three times a week for three hours each time and then want to do dragon boating as well at the weekends it was just overloading time with GCSEs coming up and that sort of thing because this was around year nine I think I was so I was, I was choosing my options for GCSEs and um and I decided to progress with dragon boating and I think what appealed to me especially was the team aspect because from coming from a, a very solo sport I didn't do much um synchronized trampolining I was mainly um just competed on my own which I I, I didn't do badly in and I enjoyed that I just I've never seen you started yet. to prefer yeah just started to prefer the team aspect of it and I, I enjoyed the camaraderie of working within the team and racing and that sort of thing and that that very much started my water sports career if that's the right word but the, yeah that sort of thing well we'll come, we'll come back on to your um <clears throat> your gb exploits in a minute but uh a few things we might um sprung to mind when you said that the first was i remember when you started getting involved in um in dragon boating uh and you i think i was in the senior team at, uh, once maybe 2011 before i got into the coaching side of things and you came along um as a, a drummer at one of the training sessions down on in kingston and you were doing some backflips and stuff and i remember you discussing or talking about your spatial awareness and how you when you're in the air you spotted something and obviously i appreciate from other sports and stuff i've done you know you go where your, where your body goes but how you described yeah, yeah. when you were turning in the air, and I was thinking, as a 12, 13 year old, and this is not uncommon to any athletes or gymnasts, that amount of awareness of your body and how you would turn, I mean, it, just, it was just phenomenal to me because me as a, uh, we were very different in terms of when we were the same age, but yeah. I had no idea, no concept of that as a 12 or 13. And just, it just highlighted to me the, the wealth of choices and opportunity kids have got today and of course you have to make a a choice and that reminds me when I was maybe yeah. a little older than that maybe 14 15 um, I was in the Barnet Brass Band I played the, the trombone yeah yeah I made a, a bad yeah. mistake a, 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 a bad error because basically I, at that point for, in, in favor of doing my O-levels um, I gave up the trombone and that, I thought that was the right yeah. thing to do but that was rather foolish in the long run because the uh, Barnet Brass Band became the um, the, the colonel of the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. And had I persisted with that, I could have had a completely yeah. 
different career. Now, I don't, I'm not unhappy with the career <laughs> yeah, I had. You yeah. see what I mean? How you make these choices at all sorts of yeah. times in your life, and they take you off in different avenues. Sometimes it's a blind, blind alley. Sometimes it's a motorway, but that's just the way it is. But the other thing that made me smile yeah, when you said exactly. that, that, was, that, that um, just was Marlow. Um, Marlow, where you started your dragon boating career, was actually where I started my long distance kayaking career with Phil Jordan. We did the uh, the DW, did it a few times. Oh right, the yeah. I did it was eighty nine, um, and we used to train from Marlow because we were in the Met Police. Um, yeah. DW team. Anyway, you were saying there. You were saying you. I just interrupted you there. Shouldn't really interrupt my uh, interviewees. Should I? No, no, no. I was just adding to that point where you were talking about choices and that sort of time where it's becoming like you like 12, 13, 14 years old and you, you choose in your options for, for your O-levels or GCSEs and that sort yeah. of thing. It's, it's a very important time in many aspects because you're not only choosing your career, um, your education, that sort of thing at that time, but if you, if you are competing in sport, that's the sort of time where you have to decide what you want to progress with. Like you, you, can, you can do as many sports and after school activities as you want up until then, but that's the sort of point where you think, I actually have to do something different than yeah. this now. I have yeah, to choice is to, good. And then, yeah, yeah. It's, it's natural, yeah. But yeah, no, I think I'll make the right choice. <laughs> I always saw my job, uh, whatever, as your father was, guy, hopefully, hopefully guiding and advising that choice rather than dictating it. Now, clearly, we're not going to say go and be a yeah. drug dealer and go going down a pub, that sort of thing. Obviously, there's obvious safety. <laughs> but within, within the wide, broad, safety net of common sense I, I really enjoyed that and still enjoy that the the agency that you can give young people within sensible parameters i mean that's just, yeah. just it's not exactly my take on it but it's just it seemed sensible to us and i think a lot of parenting is um testing it as you go along i'm sure your mum would agree with that as well yeah 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 so, yeah. so okay i mean interesting um i've i've still got my uh my um Dragon Boat Scout badge. It's sewed onto a pair of shorts I bought in, um, in yeah, um, yeah. Hungary. Yeah. Not Hungary, um, the Czech Republic, 2014. And I sewed them on there this year. Yeah. I'm, really, I'm, very, I'm very proud of that uh, Dragon Boat Scout because at that stage, for those few short days, you actually done, had done more Dragon Boat racing than I had. Oh, <laughs> just a bit, <laughs> maybe one, one or two races. But, yeah. but it went on yeah. from there. Okay. So, so what was interesting, obviously you've, you've moved on. Uh, I know you still helped me out with on the corporate side of things and that sort of thing, and, and that's great. Um, but what, what, well, if you're in a nutshell, if you were talking to another person, another 12, 13 year old Henry Smith or, or Henrietta, what was the key thing? What actually interested you as a young person before you became a young adult? What, what was the key things that, uh, I know you're all in the same boat, but what was it that maybe if you were trying to appeal to a group of 12, 13, 14 year old, whatever, how would you, what, what sort of broadly, what, how would you address it? How would you approach it? Um, so going into the sport, I think for everyone, not just for young people, there's two key aspects. So I think, I think there's a lot, a lot with sport. It's like the social side and the competitive side. Yeah. So you've got some people who, or well, the majority of people like, I presume are like me, where it's, it's not just about the competition. It's not just about the social. It's a bit of both. And, yeah. and you enjoy both aspects almost equally. Yes. In a sense. And I think very, very much before joining the junior team in 2014, like the, the junior national team, um, it was very much about the competitive side because I wasn't really integrated with a lot of people my age then which was just the nature of it. And, and that wasn't a problem. Like, I still really enjoyed the competitions and the, the national events and obviously competing uh, in America and that sort of thing uh, at first. Um, but when joining the junior team, being, I think I was, what was I, 15, 14, 15, around then, that's when you really start, I, I really started to see the social side as well because I was in a team of all people under 18, all people my age and that that, uh, that that combination of the social aspect and the the competitive side and being able to work with your 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 mates within a team just really appealed to me especially as i said before was coming from a sport where yes i was a trampolinist and I, I had friends within the club and that sort of thing but you were competing on your own and it was very wasn't lonely but it was almost like you can it's, 
I much prefer the team atmosphere. And like we always say, you know, Dragon Boat, we say it in our briefs all the time, Dragon Boating is a core, pure team sport, that sort of thing, because you're working so closely with the people. And I think from right from the start, from then, realising how close you become with your team and how sort of the blend that you form by training together and socialising together as well, I've seen that in many ways, because not, not just as a drummer right at the start, not just as a paddler, but then helming and steering in later years and then also coaching i've seen i've seen that how that blend affects a team and i think that that's like i said that social that really uh, appeals to me and the it always amazed me how much how much a good blend affected a team's performance and that that really interests me so if i was saying to uh, a younger age group why i was so interested like I was very like I said I was very competitive in sport and that sort of thing so I really enjoyed the competitive aspect but the social aspect as well and it was a great I always felt it was a great balance between the two because it's it doesn't force you into social situa- social situations but you're you're working so closely with people that you you, you are you're naturally working in their space that like we always talked about and I, I really I, I personally really enjoyed that and I thought if you're as a 12, 13, 14, 15 year old when I started that idea of working really in a close knit group really appealed to me and I felt like if any younger people were looking to take up a team sport and possibly were interested in water sports and that sort of thing it's, it's sort of the perfect balance Yeah I mean we, we, you know we I mean? say this at our, our corporate briefings and it's because it, it chimes and it's true that um, uh Yes, yeah, so you're all in the same boat, literally, metaphorically, physically, and you're in. I mean, it's, it has implications now for social distancing and the current situations. And but you know, people talk about the human beings being um, a herd animal and that sort of stuff. But you're in a dragon boat because of the the shape and the size of the boat. You're not only in other people's personal space, <coughs> but an intimate space. And it does surprise me even now that there's so few. Yeah problems when you think about it inside somebody else's personal space but you are compelled or maybe forced not compelled really to work together and it does actually work doesn't it we talk about sort of different team sports and yeah. say, rugby field or whatever great sports but you have individual responsibilities within the team but with the the minor exception yeah. of the, the drummer cox and the, the helm steerer you are all in the same boat, boat pretty much with some minor variations doing the same thing in the same way at the same time and just just for the benefit of the viewers where exactly yeah. is the engine room of a dragon boat <laughs> so I, was, I was think i was thinking about this earlier like there's there there is i wouldn't i wouldn't i don't think there is an engine room i think I'm gonna ask everybody this, by the way. The, firstly like the, the idea of an engine room i think sounds good to the people who are sat in the middle of the boat yeah. If you actually think about it, using using the phrase engine room, it's almost like a it segregates that part of the boat from the rest. Correct answer. Correct like answer. I know. <laughs> no, well, <laughs> I don't know. It feels like it feels like a. I always felt like that was a good phrase to use to encourage the middle section of the boat, or what you people consider the engine room. Yeah. I think that's a good, a good, a good way to actually fire them up to do better because they're thinking, oh, we're, we're yeah, we're, we're in the middle of the boat, whatever. But then to the people on the outside, that's almost like, oh, is our is our effort not as? I don't, I don't really know. That is, that's the way I see it. I mean, I, I say to people, and I, I, I say this, and it it, 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 it chimes differently. But I say to people frequently, every every session, in fact, the engine room. I always ask the question: the engine room to me. This is my take on it starts at the dragon's nose and finishes at the yeah. tip of the dragon's tail because if the people drummer cox helm steerer every single paddler if they're not contributing to the driving the boat fast forwards what are they doing now you different size well, people it, it, yeah. can deliver power in different ways but yeah that's that's i'm interested just i, I think i'm going to ask everyone that question because it always tends well, to be like a different it, yeah. answer yeah if you if you think about it, other team other team sports, say football, like the midfield, obviously is the core of 
of your attack of your 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 setup your you know, whatever but you can't have a good team without a defense and a front section as well That's right. so You're part of the team it, it's, it's the same idea and and and, and going through and the 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 canoe polo side, like as I've moved on to that sort of thing, it's the same idea. Like it's it's a more tactical based sport, but it's still, and, and there's less people obviously because you don't have twenty people on the on the pitch at the same time. But it is the the same idea where if you've got, I don't know, if you sort of single one person out as as the main person, it, it's sort of like well, what are the rest of us doing? Like is it just about that one person? It's about everyone working. I think that's 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 a common bit that's missed in team sports. Is yes, you've got you've got great individuals, but they're not they're not great. But they 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 think they're well. You've got great individuals, but those individuals need to work together to make a great team. That's all. Okay, I'm going to talk. That, that's a really good point. I'm going to talk to you in a minute about um, the the skills um, attributes that you've carried forward from that particular sport, from dragon boating into canoe kite polo. But first. You, you, you've, you've not mentioned, and you're quite, you're quite a uh, uh, humble and magnanimous sort of chap. You've, you've, you've forgot to mention there that you were the when you progressed from the juniors onto the the um, the premier team, you actually became the uh, youngest ever helm steerer, I think, in in history to to helm a um, a British premier team dragon boat. And in the words of um, Jess King, and she won't mind me saying this, Jess King is a very high quality outrigger paddler in Hong Kong. And she was in the premier team in 2017 in Kunming. And when she saw you surf the dragon boat down the Chinese team's wash, and she said to me, I've never ever seen anybody manage to do that. And I remember saying to her, well, <laughs> I taught him as much as I knew about um steering a dragon boat but he's now operating way outside of that way outside he's just basically flying from the seat of his pants and he's just going with instinct i'm thinking this is the way this is the way to steer boats just to go with it and i appreciate there was all sorts of um um concerns because you're a young lad doing that and me saying to you no carry on because whatever you're doing keep going keep going keep going because what you're learning there you're you're learning more than I can actually teach you because you're experiencing things I've experienced. So tell us a bit about that. Tell us not just that incident, but how you, how you as an individual, learned from just pushing yourself beyond your known, not the known world, but your your. You see what I mean? Your how you how you learned that how, a hugely steep learning curve because we're putting a young lad on the back of a premier boat and some of those washes, off the uh, off the Chinese boats are big washes to deal with. <laughs> But tell us yeah. a bit about that. Tell us about experiences of that sort of stuff. So, when I sort of my transition into helming wasn't wasn't straight away. So yeah. at the start, I did I, I started doing a few races, and I remember you'll remember this. There was one race we did at Saint Neots, and I, I can't remember who was in the final. It was I think we were amateurs were in the middle lane, and we had I think it was Rage on one side and Rage Tense. on the other. Uh, Thames, Thames. Or Thames, or yeah. one of the yeah, yeah, and and that that was I remembered that specifically because of the circumstance of the race where um, I think we were slightly ahead and the Thames boat or the Thames, the boat on our left came and crashed in the side and crashed into the side of us on the straight course and and sort of t boned us a little bit in the middle of this race yeah. and I remember thinking at the time that was. Uh, and I don't really remember what to think at the time. I just remember thinking, "What am I going to do to sort this out?" Rather than complain at the time, that it was, I just always thought it was really important to to deal with the problem then. And I, 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 I feel like there was, I don't know, that that really sticks out to me in my helm, the helming side of it, because that that's that sort of carried forward uh, that idea of especially on the international stage, you don't really know what's going to happen. So it's about trying to prepare as best you can for as many situations as you can. Yeah. But I, I don't, really know, don't really know how to describe it. I, I, just, a lot of, I had a lot of experience on so the corporate circuit as well as the, 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 the racing circuit. And it, it, it helped me a lot to sort of see every aspect of helming. 
yeah. and almost when I when I when I transitioned from being a drummer into a paddler and then into a helm, going back to what well, I say going back, going to helming from being a drummer in the past was almost like um looking back it was almost like relearning skills i'd already learned because when you were a drummer obviously i don't know i was 13 years old 14 years old like and being very young being a drummer in some of the teams that i i that we, we competed in helped me a lot with like communication but not just communication is like here's a list of things to say just say them when you want it's not that it's about being able to see what's happening in a race being able to see what a crew's doing and what they need and i think that's why a lot of people like, it's very easy to say like oh the, the drummer isn't a lot but you just sound a drum but I, I think that taught me a lot of communication especially under pressure and, and those sorts of skills like, like in the, those the, the first few years of competing oh, and then you transition to yeah. paddling yeah, and you transition to paddling and you do less of that because you're focusing on your on your work, on your paddling rather than your calls, and you sort of leave the calling to the helm and the, the drummer. And then going back to helming, I sort of relearn all those skills. And even more so, especially in like a 2,000 metre race where you've got a turning circuit or even straight races, it's so important to like think ahead and, and, and try and base what you're saying and base what you're doing on what needs to be done not what you do you know what I mean it's sort of reacting to certain things that happen you, and, and got, certain calls that are needed at the time you, you taught me something you know I mean? remember, remember we went to um, Tampa in 2011 and, and you essentially went and I, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way to my mind you went as the the second drummer you don't normally take a second drummer you went as a second drummer because you're my son at the end of yeah. it yeah. you were you were the number one drummer and you basically forged that situation yourself. That's my take on it. Other people have a different perspective. But what was interesting was there you're, you're, you're sat on a, on a senior mixed boat and there's basically people who could be your, your parents or your grandparents. I remember you saying to me at some stage, why should these people listen to me? Now, the fact that um, all the mothers in the boat loved you anyway, I mean, that's <laughs> the fact of it. What I remember saying to you, and I sort of said, said it spontaneously and then thought, actually, this is right. Just Use your emotion. If you put emotion into it, people will respond. And in fact, as a result of that and other things, that's how I now teach the subject. I say, you know, if you're a drummer, you're a cox, same thing to me. Um, the least important thing you're doing is actually hitting a drum. The most important thing you're doing is yeah. pulling out yeah. the emotion. So Michelle Teasel, Michelle Teasel in Dubai, that is why she is an absolutely excellent drummer cox. Because small in status so she is she is absolutely massive on emotion and if anybody can pull yeah. performance yeah. out of the team that girl can yeah and i very much hope yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I spoke to her last week I, she, she will she is my number one drummer in the whole world so michelle if you're listening yeah. Yeah. that is a fact it's the emotion isn't it and that, that, what they say as a yeah. drummer yeah. there's a repertoire um but you, you know, I don't listen to that. I don't listen to um, the words they're saying. What I'm, what I'm feeding off is the emotion. And that's, that's something that uh, yes, was interesting yeah. there. Um, but that so you mentioned... That, the that, original that, point, like, yeah. yeah. You, you mentioned that point. About, about the yes. helmet, I thought. Yeah, but when you got onto something, that, yeah. that, was, that was one of the pleasures as a parent, watching a child or a young adult as it came in dragon boating. Because that particular day, whatever day it was, I think um, Paul, Paul Coster, in fact, he was, he was steering, I think, the Thames boat and their sweep all broke and they came into us and we i think we started off we we might have won the start but i think raisby had moved ahead uh and we were sort of uh, in a bit of a melee with thames and bearing in mind there's you a little lad and you're steering a two-ton dragon boat when you think about it with everyone up 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 all up yeah. and it, it wasn't the smallest crew it wasn't the biggest crew and then somebody quite calmly after all that sort of uh fracas somebody calmly might have been craigie up front said something like race start and we just locked in and went race on one start, race yeah. <laughs> and the, yeah, this yeah. maturity as a parent when you see um your young lad or your, your, your son or your daughter or whatever and as they're growing up you see those little green shoots of maturity so 90 percent of the time you're little henry mm -hmm. and then you'll see that green shoot of maturity and that was one example and that's that's the great pleasure that i saw as a parent apart from the fact that you'd have races where you've got your son in my case 
alongside you. That's still <laughs> the, the greatest um, yeah. experience yeah. I've had in Dragon Boat. Because, you know, lots of people, I, I decided this early on that, yes, I could take me to football on a Saturday morning and stand on the uh, touchline and, and shout, come on, Henry, blah, blah, blah. Or I could do something where we're literally in the same boat doing the same activity. And that, to me, as a parent, is, is a, a wonderful thing to do. But you, yeah. as a, yeah. I'm interested in your perspective. I, mean, I know I'm your dad and stuff, and maybe, <laughs> but what is it like as a, as, a, as a child and a young adult doing the sport your dad or your mum's doing? Just give us a perspective on that. Yeah, the start, like, like I, you spoke about this, where um, it was it was hard seeing how people would want to listen to you as like a young teenager yeah. on the front of the boat or, or whatever barking calls at you. Like I always, I don't know. Sometimes I felt like uh, I don't didn't really know what I was bringing exactly, and yeah. I think. I think going through the paddling side of it helped with that a lot because I obviously started off as a drummer and then moved on to paddling, did the juniors for a year, did the, the prems for a year in Canada and that sort of thing. Um, I think that allowed me to sort of, obviously I developed a lot in my paddling, but it allowed me to prove myself. So obviously in the juniors, I was, I was, I can't remember whereabouts in the pack I was. I think I was like like middle top. I wasn't I wasn't anywhere near the fastest paddler in yeah. in the group, but I wasn't the slowest. And I think that sort of thing. I don't know. I I was I was always really intrigued by the idea that within this group, within this team, you've got your not only there's an element of competing against each other because you're competing to get faster, to, to be the best in the team, to to earn your place, technically. But then when it comes to it, I like the fact that, like, this is what I was saying earlier, I like the fact that even though you're competing with your mates, you all come together and you compete together. That's like the, the dynamic you have, which I really liked. And that's what was different to what I'd done previously. But as a, as a young person doing it, I think the biggest step was moving up to the prems, where... Um, Again, I definitely wasn't the fastest paddler, and I definitely wasn't the slowest. Yeah. And I, it was it was a great feeling doing time trials and putting in times and that sort of thing, and and talking to people how how they're doing and seeing and realizing that even at sixteen, seventeen, was I sixteen, seventeen? How old was I? No, it was I was seventeen, I think. Yeah, I was, I was, seventeen. Yeah, you're you're sort of a uh, yeah. I was I was I was I was sort of I was sort of, I'd sort of earned my place in the team and I, I loved yeah. that because it, because it, it was very I know I I expect I got some impressions from some people because I will also for that year I could have still competed in the juniors yeah. I still could have been a junior paddler and that sort of thing and I decided to move up to the prems and that sort of thing and uh, I, th I thought it was important to myself that I proved to myself that that wasn't a mistake by moving up to soon in a sense so obviously obviously you encouraged me and, and that sort of thing and and I'm so glad I did because that made me push harder in training yeah. it meant that when I was training I wasn't competing against um people my age which which is still good that's just that was not not um putting that down at all but I was I was trying to earn my place amongst people who had trained for years and years and I think it made me push harder in a sense, which which I loved. It, it was almost daunting, but I loved it at the same time. I, I think that's great because I mean, um, I remember somebody saying to me at one stage, because uh, it's competitive, and they're saying to me, "What happens when you're yeah. sat <laughs> yeah. in a time trial can paddle faster than you?" And I said, "You celebrate. Yeah, what are you doing this for? Do you expect? Do you always expect? Yeah, yeah, would I be celebrating now? Here's me, 58 years old. You, 21 years old." If you if you cannot outperform me, then you need to up your game. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's not but cool. people expect yeah. you to say, Oh no, it's terrible. He can he can go faster than me. I mean, you know, you know. <laughs> but that's that's just I, th I think I think yeah, a lot a lot of respect in, in sport and that sort of thing. I always thought this a lot of respect, especially from people that are older than you and people with more experience, comes from when you prove yourself, when you like you you 
you don't just talk about it like you actually show that you can perform in in at that level yeah Do you know what i mean i think that was that was a very much a key part of um me developing um in that aspect because before yeah. like i said i i felt like i was i don't know I didn't really see how people, why people were listening to me because I was just a kid and I was just shouting orders. But when you start yeah, you, to actually you, you, integrate and compete with them, but you then, forged then you, your, you, you, you forged sort of, your own fellow. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you want to sort of, you want to sort of prove yourself to everyone. And I think that, like, I'd like to think that sort of gave me a little bit of respect. And I, and those people in that team, are still very good friends with. Now I see them, and I talk to them that sort of thing, and and. I really liked that aspect. I, I I really liked having to prove myself, having to train hard and compete at a top level to sort of earn my place. And yeah. that, I think that from then on, moving to Helming, obviously when I went into my A levels, moved on to Helming from there in Rome in 2016, and having to prove myself again, having to prove myself as the best, and using the skills I'd had previously as a drummer. Yeah, and combining that with my helming as well, that was almost another challenge, and I liked I liked doing that because I, I probably could have trained and done another year of paddling, which would have been good. But the this is sort of going back to the helming. The last question you asked about that moving on to helming it was another challenge, and it was something different. As you know, the Rome course that we uh, we competed at was wasn't wasn't like a race spec course it was very narrow it was very shallow that sort of yeah. thing and I think through all the competitions I've done as a helm and a, a young person I sort of learned that you can have as much experience as you want but you have to that awareness is so key in that part uh, in that yeah. aspect because you never know what will happen that like you, you can train in race as much as you want um all times of year, all around the country. When it comes down to it, you could be in a, a world championship 2,000 metres and Iran, as they did, capsize in front of you. Absolutely. And you've got it happens. It happens, 20, yeah. 20, 22, 22 people on one of the race corners in the water. and Or you could have someone come into the side of you. You could have someone fall off. I think, I think there's, so many, there's so many variables that it makes it exciting. No, you know, when, and, and it's very yeah. Right. Well, I, I well, that's an incident. That that is situation in where uh, in this case, uh, um, Iran capsized in front of us. When I talk about, uh, we were doing it with the seniors before we closed down. As in terms of, uh, um, we, yeah, why why do I teach so many tactical manoeuvres in two k racing? Yeah, you because know, ideally you'd carve your way around the course. But of course, you need these tactical manoeuvres just in case exactly that happens, and so you learn from that experience. Now, I'm going to actually invite you back. It's amazing. We're on 36, 37 minutes already. I'm going to invite you back yeah. for um, another session just to talk about helming. I'm going to ask you one more, one more question just to round off today. Um, I'll just state that what was interesting, everyone expects if your son or, as in Sonia, if your wife, for example, is in the team, then you give them a bit of a, an easy run. But actually, you probably had it harder. Because I was not not so I wanted to demonstrate anything, but I wanted you to really forge your own way to to, to plow your own furrow and and you know establish yourself on the team, and you did and you did um, very well. But my last question for you is, in a nutshell, if you can. So now you've moved away from dragon boating as your main sport, and I didn't expect you to stay as you as you developed on and became a, an adult rather than a young adult. You wouldn't be doing the same sport as your dad or your mum does, and that's that's fine. But give me a, a quick idea about what that sport has given you. Moving on, you've sort of touched upon it in a nutshell. Now you're doing other sports or doing other things in life, and really you're living, you're pretty much independent. Just give us a, 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 a perspective on that, just to round off. So we're moving away from dragon boating. Yeah. Um, what, what lessons moving to you university, take moving to canoe polo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I think there's lessons that I've learned from every aspect of the sport through however many years that I competed for and still still doing obviously court prevents and, and, and things like that. I think there's like from each aspect of drumming, paddling, helming, coaching and working, 
there's there's elements of of communication and organization and team working that you just can't get from other sports yeah and that's what intrigued me about it because it's so different and the amount of that it, it's different in a sense that it's a less well-known sport in this country but it's different in a sense of the dynamic you have with the team and i think that by going through every element of the sport up to like corporate working and, and helming and that sort of thing i think each each has taught me different lessons but they all sort of merge into one if you know what i mean it, yeah. it, it's it is communication in a different way. It's organisation in in it's, it's awareness. It's it. I think it's just unique. It's hard to describe because it's 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 hard to describe unless you've experienced it. If you know I, what I mean. I, I think I'll round it off by uh, quoting. It's a it's a Latin or an Italian saying, and you know I love my sayings and my phrases. As long as you live, learn how to live. It's probably some Roman yeah. senator or something, some Greek philosopher said that. I'm not yeah. sure the etymology of it, but it's really great if you start at an early age. And of course, life is a, a lesson, isn't it? It's a lifelong lesson. You don't sort of get to 18 and start yeah, learning. So exactly. that's a pleasure as a, as a parent to see that. But I tell you what, we're now just over 40 minutes. I thought this would take about 20 minutes. I'm going to, Henry Smith, thank you very much. I'm going to invite you back, okay? I invite you back just to talk about helping okay. and other stuff. Because it's, Okay, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the second of my uh, interviewees for the new Paddle Shanties feature, which I'm hoping is going to be quite popular. And as I, as I said previously, it's about not about dragon boating. Well, it is and isn't. It's really about the the um, unsung heroes, grassroots people, people who are working at promoting the sport at all sorts of levels. You don't necessarily get to hear about and all these people have a an interesting backstory that brings them into it. Diverse, intriguing, and no more so. Than my good friend Paul Costa here. Now, what I know about Paul Costa, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna correct me, because what I know is I know Paul Costa from since I've been involved in dragon boating, initially with Thames, I believe, certainly a prime mover and instigator with Windy Pandas, and you can tell me how the the name came about as well. I know you're really closely involved and an instigator of the London Lions Festival, which is probably, uh, and I'll, I'll stand corrected, but I think it's the most interesting and exciting and well managed dragon boat festival that we run in the uk so that's a big feather in your cap as well that's what i know but there's lots of other stuff i know you've been on the, on the executive at some stage so right off the bat before we get on to that because we're really keen on promoting windy pandas which is a great team that i've had the pleasure to help just tell me what they're up to at the moment in these these uh, restricted conditions uh windy pandas at the moment so uh, they're they're basically um We'll say norm normally in the winter time they're hibernating and they're eating their bamboo shoots but uh, wow. in the in the <laughs> uh, no this time they've actually been very very proactive this year um wow. they've been really really pushing the boat out the captains have been very very proactive um they've been doing quite a lot of gym sessions um through using zoom yeah. um and lots of other things that have been going on around underneath underneath the the, the, the usual sort of gym type normal stuff like that but behind the scenes myself and the the captain and the treasurer we've been doing things um, strategic type things we've having meetings with the water sports center we've been wow. you know sorting out the, the boat insurance and you know all these sort of things that have been going on as well so it's not just all to do with um uh, land coaching or yeah like that is um, other things that need to be uh, seen and, and to be done and of course keeping an eye on what's going on because the, the BDA are still very very keen in um, trying to see if they can get some kind of uh, racing this year yes yeah. um, so they're still very keen on that and um, they're still earmarked to have um, uh, an event um, in September at Surrey Keys yeah. And I've been liaising with the centre there that they're, they're still very keen to run it. And um, hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, um, it will it may go ahead. What kind of format it's going to be, we just don't know yet, but it's still on the cards. So things like that have been going on. It's, it's, it's not been totally quiet at all. It's, um, I mean, as an organiser, I know myself, maybe it's sort of a different squad level stuff. In order for you, for somebody to turn up and paddle, 
there's a huge amount of work, logistics, <laughs> arranging, going on, just so you can turn up as a paddler. You can turn up a paddler. People don't, people don't realise that, and it's fair enough. And of course, their job is to come and paddle and get coached and do as well as you can. But you're obviously keenly involved in that or closely involved in that sort of stuff. But you mentioned before we started that you're you're looking to get some sponsorship from Sport England for another boat or... Well, we're trying to... Um, I mean, again, this, this is another thing that we've been looking at is... At the end of the day, the centres still want their money for the storage fees. Yeah. Um, you know, we are a, we're a club. We're not a rich club um, by any by any means. We rely on membership. We don't have any sponsorship. So what we're um, putting in an application form that Sports England they got this community funding that's um, yes, yeah, an emergency yeah. community funding. So we're waiting to hear from that. Hopefully, um, we, we you know again we, we might get. Um, get a bit of money out of them or something like that that might just ease ease the pressure um but you know, the center have been sort of you know quite reasonable at the moment and so we've already told them and said look you know we haven't had any membership coming in at the moment so we're um you know scrimping and scraping around to and you still want your money but you know if we haven't got the money um what do you, you know, yeah what? lots of lots, i mean lots of people feeling the pinch aren't there lots of companies and organizations you know, I hate to think a lot of these organisations that appear to be rich and affluent and that sort of stuff and actually are quite heavily in debt. Yeah. And I'm, I'm even talking to sort of drag about organisations abroad that I just deal with. That, you know, they're, they rely upon people getting involved in events and no events means no exactly. revenue. So, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, it's the same thing here. It's, you know, if you don't, you cannot, you know, you, you expect so you cannot sort of charge people, you know, membership if they're not going on the water. Um, you cannot uh, expect them to do that. What, but what we are trying to do, taken away from the financial side of things, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to, you know, keep the team together, keep the social side of it going together. Um, we've had some fantastic events. We've got a great, um, great committee uh, that started off this year. A good, great social committee. Um, the captains are the same captains from last year as well. So it's been a continuation um, without um, having to, for them to learn, new people to learn. Um, they've been gelling very, very well. Um, they're motivating the team. We're still, we're still doing the newsletters out to each week, yeah. uh, the team. We've got quiz nights. We've got, you know, a number of crazy things we've had on Zoom and yeah. stuff like that. Just keeping so the, the fabric of the team together. Yeah, absolutely. Just to keep the team going, to let them know we're still here. We... I do mem I do text members and check that they're okay and stuff like that. So we're all linking in with each other. Um, no, well, I, I can say from my experience. I mean, over the last few years, maybe the London Lions Festival, or do maybe doing some courses for you. Windy Panda's always, to my mind, is one of a very a very stylish club, and it's got a very stylish style. And it's this, you know, no no nonsense. It's all credit to you because you're the main I'm, coach, aren't you? And it's a really stylish look. It's always a good looking team. Well, it's, funny, it's funny you say that actually I'm not is it's probably the best looking team in the round so uh, well a lot of people say that but I, I think you've, you're, you're, you're going to be up there what, what do you expect when you've got a good looking CEO like me I mean they, they, you know, it's hard for the others to follow really isn't it you know <laughs> how do you just, just now working back into it so just before I go on to you specifically because that's really interesting to me Windy Pandas quite an unusual name how did the name come about well it stems it stemmed back um 2008 when the team first started and it's like most of other the dragon boat teams that started off as a they either start off as a corporate team or they start off as a chariot team don't they so um there was a jeremy chung who's the was the ceo and the, the one of the main founders of the the, um, the club wanted to raise some money uh, i think it was his grandmother was suffering from cancer well, okay. uh, for cancer and of course he wanted to raise some money for the cancer research and um got his friends together and got them training and stuff like that. And they took part in an event, part an event in Beale Water uh, some years ago. Oh, Danny Kent. I've done some stuff down there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, they've done a charity event and then, and that's how it started really from there. I mean, I think then they enjoyed it and wanted to keep going. Um, I didn't join them till a little bit later on. Um, yeah. I, was, I was their coach for quite a few years. Um, um, and then they, and I, the understanding was, I said to them at the time, that I'll coach you until such a time you can get up and run on your own. So, yeah. and now they get to that stage now that they are um, up and on their own. They have, 
a number of the team members have actually made the the, uh, the Great Britain squad, brilliant. Um, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, a number of the team now are really, really willing to take forward, and they're now coming forward and doing the coaching now. And yeah, and and, and yeah, and it's, that's how it started. Really, it just started off very, very small charity type thing. Did the, did a couple of charity events, took part in those things, and then from there it just grew and grew and grew. The good thing about what it does do is that we don't take it that serious. I mean, it's hard to say that we don't take it serious. Yes, we take the racing serious. However, what's more important for us is the, the social side, the friendship side, bonding, partnerships. Uh, that's more important than actually um, wanting to win uh, trophies at all costs. We don't, we don't go to that, that stage where we will kick someone out of the team because someone from the outside who's really good available paddler and can come in and um, make make the team stronger we we paddle together we win together we lose together um, we get drunk together we have fun together and we yeah we have you know everything is about the team and actually enjoying enjoying being part of a, a big family as opposed to being um being a, a team that is to win and to be the top not to talk it's not about that interesting you say that because i mean you know in different locations different circuits i i, I lecture on stuff like race psychology and you know people talk about queen and country and this and the other and the shirt and that sort of stuff and, and to me it's about not the you know the icing is your medals if you've managed to get some medals it's about the cake and the cake the ingredients of the cake are the team so when you're when you're when you're balls out basically it's because you're doing it for your mate sitting next to you. So I spend a lot of time in squads I, I manage or coach building that fabric. Because mm. once you've got the fabric, and I, I do know of other teams that have been good teams, really good teams with individual athletes. And they tend to be individual athletes flying in close formation rather than a team. And I'll, I'm, agree, I'm with you. If you had a, uh, you know, a true elite athlete, yeah, even, even somebody, some of the best paddlers we can think of, yes, there's a psychological effect of them being in the team but one person in a dragon boat doesn't make that much. one person can take out a whole team because they have a bad paddler that can take out people around them but you know what i mean it's more about that fabric and the, the glue that kinks the thing together but why windy pandas why the name how did that that's a bizarre name to all intents <laughs> no i can't i can't i can't let uh, i can't let on the secret oh, right. that okay one. <laughs> A trade secret. Well, okay it's then. Not so much a trade secret. It, it, it was something I'll um I'll, I'll may have to come back to to on that one. But um, okay. Okay. Yeah, we're certainly stuck. Everyone seems to um, know it. Um, we're very very well followed um, around the world as well. Which yes. is um, we have a lot of lot of great contacts, and it's nothing to do with me about that. It's how as I say it's the portrayal of Windy Pandas and what and what it, what it means. Um, being a panda, it, 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 the name sticks out. It, it, people seem to remember it very, very well. Um, you know, say it's it's the social side, it's the gelling of the side. It's when you're you're a panda, you know, you wear the panda hat. Yes. It goes with it well and stuff like that. And say so it, it just things that we do. Just people remember us, and they follow us as as well. Um, and say so they come from different parts of the country, uh, other world parts of the um, part of the world, and they they come and race with us, and then they go away, and then they'll come back again, and or they'll they'll tell their friends and say, you know, oh, if you're going to go paddling, go go see Windy Pandas and um, go go see them. So, All right. So before I just get on to you, what we'll say is at the end of this, I'm going to do a, a title screen and how people contact you if they want to join, how they get involved, because you obviously. Despite the restrictions, you're a thriving club. You're still going. You're still actively recruiting. And I can say for myself, and without, I'm not, I'm not one for my BS. I don't think, but it is a stylish club. It's Let's a still here. Let's still here. <laughs> as well. So if you're in the locality, get yourself down there. Take a look at uh, Paul and the excellent Windy Pandas. Now, brilliant for that. But how did you? I mean, you've been involved in the sport for a long, long time. So how did you? What drew you into the sport? Um, I joined. I joined Dragon Boat Racing in 1997. Wow! Right at the start, then, really, when you got going. Really, well, no, the start was before, way before then. But um, I think I, was, I mean, I'm, I'm always into team sports. I love team sports, and um, I was certainly uh, 
a good sort of 30 or 40 uh, foot, well, good 40 kilos lighter than what I am now, that's for sure. Wow. But, um, um, I did do it, well, it wasn't Thames at the time, it was Thames Dragon, they were called Texaco at the time. Oh, right, yes, 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 okay, yeah. They were called Texaco at the time, and then, um, then they changed their name to Thames. Um, we, it was, it was just purely by a, a, a colleague. I mean, I, I, I've, I've always been in, my, my main job is in education, so I've always been in education. Um, and one of my colleagues, um, who's a lecturer in, in this college where I was at, uh, her partner did the sport. And we just got chatting one day, and it started from there, basically. So I went down and um, tried it out, liked it. Uh, it's a team sport. I like the, I like the idea of team sports, and, and, and for me, it's it, it's that's what how it all started. Um, carried on really. I didn't think I was going to be any good at it. I just thought it'd just be a social thing and what have you. Um, but then, of course, then I did make the um, they say you know a lot, a lot lighter than what I am now. But I did make the national squad. Right. And uh, had the great pleasure in two thousand in Padlin in uh, Malmo. In, very enjoyable uh, and that was great fun great experience um, and I like the idea of again as other people like-minded people the racing and of course the traveling around the world is actually then taking part in other events around the world and um, it, it's the, the great thing about the sport is that you can do it from any level you know you can be the novice and you can always be a novice from day one if you want or you can spiral yourself up and you can be uh, playing you know you can be the, the paddler of the national team if you wish um, that, that's how it will start it, it's it's the different levels and how you want to do it and, and that's the great thing about the sport you can you can do it at different levels um, you know you know the, the type of, if you don't do what you do then the whole team's going to suffer it's about it is about what I said earlier you win together, you lose together. It, you, yeah. you, it's all about that. It's it's about the team. There's no individual. And you said that yourself. You could be an elite paddler, but if you don't gel with the rest of the team, then it's never. You know, they're never. The team is never. You know, the boat's not going to move the way you want it to move. And yeah, and and, that, and that's the whole thing about it, really. And and that's what I loved about the sport. It's about that thing. It's like you're 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 that little bit of cog it's like a little cog isn't it you know that little cog of the wheel but your little cog is connected to other little cogs and if your little cog doesn't work then the rest of it's not going to work and, and that's it, it makes you want to work harder to do that because you don't want to let the rest of the other cogs break down you yeah. want to you want to you want them to carry on you want them to um thrive you want it to succeed and like i say if you if you win a medal great but at the end of the day it's about how far how how strong you are how how well you paddle together as a team and, and that's that's more important you just reminded me of something I mean, jose i know jose with with uh, he's obviously yep. doing Ironman triathletes now and he's uh, was with with typhoon but when he was in my prem squad in um 2015 so we're in uh welland mm. and we either just managed to get into a we we we, we got knocked out, there's a bit of sandbagging going on, and we, we should have made the major final for the 500, but we got knocked into the semi, uh, oh, we got knocked into the minor final, and we won the minor final. I remember, whatever race it was, he come off, and he was, he, he, he was, he's all or nothing, absolutely all or nothing. He's a pristine athlete. Mm. I remember him coming off, and him, he just saying to me, he said, coach, I'm sorry, and he was absolutely, when I say crestfallen, you could look into his eyes, see into his soul, he had given absolutely everything, and it wasn't his fault, obviously, but that's what I do it for. Now, win, lose, or draw, when people actually go out absolutely on the line, those, mm. those are the men, oh, you know, yeah, I've won medals and I've done this and I've done that, but the, 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 this, this, the, the personal relationships, and when you're in, a, in the pen and um, you get to know your people, and you really are, you know, you're trying to motivate, you're going down the line doing the old Jason Leonard thing, sort of trying to motivate people, and you know something about each person you're puzzling into. To me, that's what it's about it's that fabric and that's team. But I mean, but absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm, can't, I can't agree with you enough to be honest with you. Well, you, but, you, you get that on, on the line, and it's you know, the, the, the team in, in getting them to believe in themselves, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And always remember one particular race we had at, at the, one of the London London Regatta events, and we, um, I think it was the Surrey Keys, and we were like, 
at the time, I think we were like 0.2 of a second behind, um, I think, Raysbury, one of the big major teams. And they just pipped us. And had we beaten them, we would have gone into the major final of the 200 metres. I mean, it's that sort of closeness that, you know, and they didn't believe that they could actually do that. You know, it's, it's, it's getting them to self-believe that they can actually get, and, and you know, you don't, they don't, because they don't train as much as some of the other elite paddlers do. I mean, some of the, the other major clubs, like the Amethysts and the, the Waysburys and the, the UK teams like that, training all the time. If they're not in the Dragon Boat, they're in no one. They're only one in the gym. Our team doesn't do that. Our yeah. team, we do, we do our training. We do a twice a week on the water. We do a gym session. We have socials. We have that sort of gel. And when you're, and you know this yourself, when you're at a start line, and you hear that sound, you hear that down and ready, and that, that silence, that split-second silence, you can feel, you know, that like a, the roar of a dragon, the power coming yeah. up within you. And, and, and everyone's doing that at the same time. If everyone does that at the same time, you feel it. You just feel it around you. You don't, you don't have to say anything. You just, you just feel it. And, and that's what makes, that's what really makes it, you know, oh, it makes it so worth it in the end that you've done, you've done this and, you know, you, you, you being part of that and the fact you know yeah. it's the same i mean races are, are won and lost by the you know the one team just so happened as they're going crossing the line they've got the paddle in the water where you're just coming up in the recovery that's how races are won and lost it's just and yeah i can i can relate to what jose says about that so you can't you know i can't give any more but i gave so much and i'm really yeah. sorry we didn't do it but no you shouldn't be sorry you gave your all and, that, and that's and if you can sort of walk off that water saying that you've given your all, honestly, hand and heart and giving your all, no one's going to ask any more of you. Uh, I'll tell you a silly story. This is at a World Cup a couple of years ago and we were in a minor final. And the minor final is us, Germany, Hong Kong. And in the minor final, Germany beat us by 0 0.118 of a second. And we beat Hong Kong by 0 0.009. I mean, there was no, you know, you daren't look left or right because it's that close. And I, I actually swore, unusual for me, I said, what, what the hell do we need to do to beat Germany? And Liz Williams from Amethyst said, you, <laughs> you need to do more. <laughs> and that's it. And it's those, that's, that in, that's exactly it, isn't it? And it's that, that yeah. I don't know where more is, but you've got to find it from somewhere. And that's, it's that, that, that sort of... I don't know where it comes from. It's, I mean, I always remember that we just missed another, again, another London event. And we were lined up against all the other teams, the big top teams, like, you know, at the time, and we're talking about four, four years ago. And I don't think we were that as strong as we were, but we thought we, we were strong at, at the time. But... I thought we were strong, but the team didn't think they were uh, very strong. Yeah. And we were lined up in the minor final because they would just missed out in the major final again. When we mine up line final, we had all the other teams, like there was Raging Dragons, there was Henley, uh, Seclo, there was a big lineup of teams there. And I don't know where it came from, but we were somehow, everything fitted into place. We were lined up, we had the warm up was good. Team talk was good. You know, the focus in the boat, warming up to the start line was good. Everything about that was on there. We was at the start line. We were the first team lined up there. It was the, so, the silence in the boat, you could hear a pin drop. And from that word go, when you heard that, are you ready, attention go. We just like powered off the line and we beat all the other teams, you know. And it was, they came back and they said, wow, you know, really really good you know it's like you got your team you know, they all come other team members have come up and saying congratulations you know obviously pissed, you know, peed off because we beat them yeah. but obviously they say look it, it's it's your day and sometimes it is like that though isn't it sometimes yeah. it is it's, it's your day and you know you can you you do all the preparation you do all the way but just sometimes it just just doesn't go right the water doesn't like, suddenly there's a gust of wind that just stops you or something like that or something plays up somewhere suddenly a, a paddle's broken or the drum is just missed a beat or the, the helm's fallen off the back yeah, yeah, I think it happens, things, it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. these things happen and but that, that one particular time we'll say the two occasions and on um on with the pandas it it, it it just triggered everything figured in right and yeah it, it you say that for us but that 
that's the icing. That's the icing on the cake. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we didn't win a medal, but it was the icing on the cake because it was absolutely everything went well, everything was perfect. And they say that the ingredients, like you said, the ingredients is us gelling, us working hard together, us being part of the team. Yeah, so that was, yeah, you, you can't, oh, yeah, you can't, you can't, I don't, yeah, you, you can't put a price on it sometimes. You really can't put a price on it because it is actually. What's yeah. really great to hear, like you say, been involved in the sport since 1997. And it's what is great to hear that the enthusiasm that you still express <laughs> for the sport all these years later and that that is infectious that really is i mean that's 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 that conveys more than mm. actually it's a bit like you know when i train drummers i was talking to henry about this morning because he started as a drummer yeah we we train we train our drummers to yeah the most least important thing i do is hit a drum but it's not what they say they have a repertoire of words but what i'm plugging into myself is the emotion mm. if, if somebody's committed and they they're what they're doing there's the emotion there then then people will respond to that so if you're putting that that sort of emotion, that sort of commitment into your coaching that you're putting into even talking to me now, I'm not surprised. I really am not surprised. Mm. Windy Pandas is a successful team that it is because it does. It's infectious. It, you know, the more enthusiastic you are, the more successful you be because you will because it, it will we'll pick that up and people run with that. It's the same yeah, way, but, if you're really miserable moping around and not interested, yeah, then nobody else is going to be interested. Yeah, but it, it's not one. But it's not one person that makes the team. As I've got the enthusiasm when I was coaching them, that's get the one part of it. They say that's part of the cog is that part. But then you've got the other parts of the cog. You've got then the captains that are organising the team. You've got the you know, the organisation of like then getting arranging to get the boats there. You've got the arrangements of actually making sure the equipment, the paddles are there. Who needs a paddle? Who needs a buoyancy aid? You know, yeah. it's. Do we need accommodation? Who can share what? Car sharing, or should yeah. we get a new bus? You know, it's um, it's that it's that side of it. Who's going to tow the boats? Who's yeah. going to load the boats? Can we arrange the load? It, all these other things that people don't see that goes on behind them. I mean, you're right. You said that earlier. What you know? What some people don't see that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. Okay. Look, when I was mentioned earlier on boat insurance what i mentioned earlier on about making sure our storage fees are paid making sure we've got some kind of income coming in and stuff like this you know all these things that go on if we don't have these sort of things we're not going to be able to race anyway you know but yeah. it's that part of it and the good thing about what the pandas have is that everybody has their little bit to do you know say so the captain cheryl she does a great job and what she does with the, the advice and the vice vice camera with Rob and Carmen, they work really, really well together as, as a gel, the unit. They, 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 they you know, delegate the work to each other sometimes and stuff like this. And, you know, they've got other people that will sort out the accommodation. It, it's, it's, it, that's, and, and that's what it's all about. And say so yeah. then, then you've got the paddlers underneath that then to bring them on come on, we're going to do this and, and race together. Let's have a social, let's go out for dinner after the racing. It's, you know, it, and, and that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's, 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 it's the gel. And then say, the, the cake mix, it's a really good cake mix. And then the icing on the top is when you had a really great day's racing. Really, really day's gross racing. Yeah. Tell us a bit about your involvement with Under Lions. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um... London, Hong Kong, uh, Lions, yeah. So it's a Chinatown Lions event. It's a charity, it's a big, big in China charity event. It's funded by the um, Hong Kong Trade Office and a number of other big uh, concerns like Cafe Pacific, people like that. Uh, it is mainly a charity uh, fun event and started off quite small. We used to have the event at um, Docklands Sailing Centre. Right. Yeah. Many years ago, about twenty odd years ago, so it's been going for that long actually. It's been going for about twenty odd years. Yes, it wasn't as big as it is now, that's for sure. Um, the um, the side of it is that it's we. I, I used to take part in it with a, a couple of teams that used to race. It was when I was with Thames. We used to race. Um, some of us used to. Some of us from Thames and some of us from Kingston. They all got together and they were all friends. They were friends and we yeah. got racing. In my head. That's how it started. Um, got to know, got to know the organisers a bit, you know, a little bit, and started chatting to them and what have you. And I said, 
how would you like me to see if I can, maybe we can bring some professional teams down and do some exhibition racing. And they like the idea of that. Um, and what we did for a few years, we encouraged some of the BDA teams to take part and yeah. big thank you for them to wanting to take part. And, um, you know, it, it's, if people like sort of Ian, at, you know, um, um, Ian at Raysbury and people like that. If it wasn't for them, you know, like pushing it and stuff like that. And well, that's right, because Ian was a, a Thames paddler, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a long time ago. Absolutely, yeah. yes, oh, he was. Yeah, yeah, and Robin yeah. And Tim, yeah. So yeah, it was. Um, and, and some of the other teams used to come down. And, and I think, I think what it was that they, they loved the the festival atmosphere about it. Um, yeah. I mean, let's let's be honest. Some of the BDA events. Yeah, I, I think you must think you're at a morgue sometimes. It really is. Yeah. Uh, you well, might, you know, the London Island, you know, want, but uh, it's um, it, it is. I mean, it's no, uh, and it's no reflection. Don't get, there's no reflection in any club that organise these at all. But yeah. I, um, I think it is the the, the pander in me. It is that side of me that you know. Let, let's make this fun. Let's enjoy it. Let's enjoy what we're doing. You know, and what I like the idea of what the the um, the Hong Kong festival does is the big festival thing It's the great feel about it. It's, you know, the atmosphere that goes on around it. It's the, the shows, it's the music, it's the food. Um, I mean, it's a great event. It is. I was say without a shadow of doubt, to my mind, it's the best, the it best event. Great, it's great it, it breaks down a lot of barriers, cultural barriers. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that, that side of it is, is how, how it, it, it started off quite small. We were, was very very small they used to have in the region about i don't know 20 30 teams 35 teams maybe um then um it, i have sort of asked the bda you know to consider running a league event alongside this event at the same time um i did ask them for a few years yeah i'm not saying it wasn't i'm not saying it went on deaf ears i'm just saying i think they were just maybe a bit concerned I, I don't know what uh, the reason was but the the current um current bda chairman um did see the full side of it and did see the, the the potential of it um and we did do it for the, the last year um run the league event didn't quite go to plan as how we were hoping it to do um but well, so, I mean, to be honest with you, in America, I do, I do the, I mean, not this year, uh, the Tampa Festival, and they, they, they don't call, call it corporate and racing, they call it uh, recreational and racing. So the transition there is they call it from rec to race. Yeah, that's the big transition from, mm. and we do the Tampa Festival and it's a combined event and you end up doing, you're there for 12 hours and they do a lot of, um, uh, you know, good job and blah, blah, blah on the lines and all that sort of stuff. But you end up doing about four races in the day. And when you, the thing is, when you mix corporate or recreational, you'll always, it's all about the festival and it's not about the racing. So obviously people going to BDA main, main race events, they expect, I suppose, as racers to be doing, you know, mm. sort of heat semis, finals, this and the other multiple events. And if you're going to, if you're going to um, weave in some corporate stuff, it's always going to impact on it. So that's, that, that, I suppose that's, that's to be expected. And of course, then there's competing demands, but, to my mind, I mean, I'm, this is one one opinion. I, th I think the formula there is, you know, they have to have the BDA teams, they call them professional teams or whatever. That that seems to work. But I say, if they could manage to achieve the same thing and it's a wide enough race course, then that would be good as well. But I'd, I'd hate to see you lose some of what the essence of the the London Lions event is, because it really is it is a special festival. But I say that's that's, that's just from a, a one single practitioner or you know. An event helmet point of view. Okay, let me let me just move you on because you're also involved with Dublin Vikings. I've got a few friends now because I run a I run, <laughs> I run a Thursday night exercise session. In fact, I've just done it tonight actually, and it's they're a great bunch. I think we've got maybe forty people who attend from from uh, different well, you, clubs and stuff, and they're a great bunch of people. You recall? I mean, you recall? You, you I mean, you, you recall we we went and raced over in um, together. Absolutely. That was yeah. the first time we actually raced together, wasn't it? Um, yeah. They've always been racing against you, but it's nice yeah. this time to be racing with you. Um, and we went there with the, the, the Warriors, the LSC Warriors. Um, yeah. And that was... 2017. Uh, yes, that's right. That's, I mean, I've been trying, I've been interested in delivering training in, and getting involved in Ireland since then. It's just, these things take a bit of time, don't they? So, yeah. 
Yeah. But yeah. I, I, I got approached. I, they asked the Vikings asked me to come over and do a trade a uh, coaching session with them. Right. Uh, one particular time, and um, it was very enjoyable. Um, I, I, I personally said, I don't know what I can really add to what you're doing. I thought what you, I thought what you were doing was a really great thing. What I, they were doing a great. They had a great setup. They had um, good structure. They, you know, it's just. And I, I, what I did in the end was I just showed them. So sort of, this is what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and I think they've taken on a few things what the I've done and yeah I mean I, I like I like them they're, they're nice they're nice people always always friendly um, always when they when I go back there and they always say welcome home okay? nice yeah. come, yeah, welcome home I, you know? I think this is the Irish way I did a I did a yeah. uh, a weekend it's either, it's, either that, it's either that or the Guinness I can't remember now one yeah. or the other but, uh, <laughs> but uh, they're they're a really nice bunch of people the the event and the Dublin event is uh, very well. Uh, run event, yeah. Um, it, it is, it's is really good again. That's linked again. That's another link they had with the, the Hong Kong government as well because that's uh, right. funded funded by them as well. And um, it's it's the, the Vikings actually come over and they they enjoy the the London Hong Kong uh, festival as well. Um, and really trying to encourage some of the other stronger teams to come over as well and. and yeah. um, Push them over as well, and some of the breast cancer team. So, the um, the organisers. Uh, this is a sort of side view here. The organisers of the London Hong Kong Festival like the idea of um, breast cancer teams coming over as well to be taking part. So, um, uh, this particular say last year, um, the you know, one or two of the teams came over, and hopefully, maybe more teams from other countries. And Dublin uh, as well will come over and take part of the um, the, the Hong Kong event next year. Sadly, we'll say because of the the virus, it's yeah. um, not been able to uh, run this year. So um, Which reminds me, Deborah Bonner from um, Donegal says hello. Deborah. <laughs> In fact, Deborah Bonner, she, she's a. Uh, I'm actually hoping to do something with Donegal fairly soon. Um, yeah. had, a great, had a great Hong weekend. Kong. Had a great weekend with them up there. Actually, I, I oh, went and. Okay. I went and raced. I went and raced with um, the Vikings. I think it's my one and only time I've raced. I've raced them twice now, but I went over the weekend and um, raced with the uh, Vikings um, in Donegal. Again, it's, it, it's again it's that that feeling that you know it's it, it's something that's missing in the UK. Yeah, it's yes. something that's missing. It's something that's missing that we've got in the UK where you know in the UK and there's no reflection to anyone, but it's, it's in the UK, you come up, turn up, race, you go. That's it. Yeah. yeah. When you've got the, the festival atmosphere of the Hong Kong festival, it's all going all the time. There's lots of things going on. It's not just the racing. There's other things going on. The Dublin Fest, that, that's Donegal Festival. What happened on that one? The racing was over. All back. Food, drink, chatting, dancing. It was party time afterwards, and those those sort of things is is I think it's paramount, and, and it's no different. I think when you go racing in China, I mean I've raced in China twice, two or three yeah. times now, and Hong Kong. It's that side of it as well that you know it's it's the 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 after party, it's the mingling with the, the other the team members, it's the celebration of the. Celebration yeah. of the festival, celebration of the event. I think that's probably a good word to have there for it. Is that to celebrate that you're racing, to celebrate that you know whether you win, lose, or draw, doesn't matter. That you're actually in there, you're enjoying the team, you're mingling with the other teams, you're, you're eating with food with them, you're drinking with them, you're getting drunk with them, or whatever it is that you're doing. That, but I, I think it's the yeah. Irish way, not the getting drunk, just the the uh, the zest. The way, it is the, it's uh, it's the friendly yeah. atmosphere that goes goes with it. it it's. Yeah. It's that thing about them, and the uh, Dublin Vikings are always making you feel very, very, very welcome. That's as yeah. much as um, as Deborah Bonner does. She, uh, she even got her, a, even got her a Winnie Panda top as well. That she's got Brilliant. one of those. Ask her, ask her to wear that. <laughs> I'll get to wear that. I'm going to ask you one more question because that links into to Deborah and because obviously the IBC PC rep um, for Ireland as well, but. Yeah. The, I know you had some connections with some friends of mine down at Pink Champagne as well. So, so there's some stuff you've been doing, maybe Absolutely. with Wave Walkers or somebody. So your connection yeah, with that's right. Uh, just um, well, you know, it's, it's still in the it's still the coach in me. So um, with the pandas, can't start up coaches. They keep, keep talking. Believe it or not, I've so I've heard. <laughs> yeah, so the the, the coaching in me is still there. So um, 
So being uh, just you know, being the CEO of the pandas is one side of what I'm doing. So my new project now is with a breast cancer survivor team uh, called Wave Walkers. Yes. Uh, they have been going for some years. Uh, I think they were at a point of actually, it was just purely by accident that I met them. Um, so I coached them part of the year last year and we started off this year. We did very positive uh, layouts of what was going on and, and finding each other's strengths and weaknesses and was building on that yeah. it's different cuts different type of coaching to what you do with the pandas it's very very different so yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely yeah, absolutely uh, it's uh, you know what, what, do you mean, what do you mean you can't do 2,000 meters with a bucket on the back why not you know it's a, I, I, I have believe it, I, I have the privilege and it is a privilege of traveling around talking to different coaches and very often you'll come across a coach and they'll say well they don't get it because they, they, they seem to think that the, um, the teams you're coaching have to change themselves to suit your style. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there for me. And I think I'm, you're 100% with this. You, know, you have to change your style to suit them. Not, not fundamentally, but you know, the bottom line is about them. It's not about them listening to me. It's about them becoming, or them becoming a better paddler. Whoever the coach is, and that, that's yeah, right. that's. I, I, it's about not only, but I don't think it's not about just being a better paddler. I think it's about being a better, better team. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. About, you know why? Why you know if you're if you're a great team, then people are going to want to join you. Yes. If you know, and I think that's and and that's what the success is with the Windy Pandas. Their membership they have over like eighty members. You know, right. They're not all. They're not always down all the time, but yeah. they have eighty signed up members and. With that, is you can guarantee that they'll they're always going to get two boats out of training. Yeah, really. They're not coming up because they're coming up because they want to. They want to come out to to enjoy because they enjoy the, that side of it. And what Wave Walkers is going to hopefully start doing is that side of it as well. Is it, and, I, and I learned this when I went down with Pink Champagne and when I when I, I spent a, a training session with them. So I wanted to learn what they what they did, and it's. Yes, the paddling is there. And you talk to, I mean, the heart-wrenching stories, don't get me wrong, heart-wrenching stories. You've got, like, sports women down there, you know, that professional sports and stuff, and then suddenly it feels like their their legs have been cut away from them. You know, yeah. Stuff like that, you know, and you listen to their stories and, you know, to a point of making you weep. And, and you think, you know, I, I'd love to get involved in this. And what's happened now with wave walkers now is now suddenly they've got this rejuvenation going on inside them now you know there's like people i want to work on the website now there's people doing the facebook there's people membership they're doing socials they're doing they're building up this rapport they're building up the the, the social side of it and then the paddling is coming in Brilliant. with it and they and they you know it's nothing unusual during the winter time they were getting like a, you know a, nearly a full boat Wow. During the winter time, you know, it's it's, it, it's not not this. So um, yeah, so this is my this is my new project uh, with them, and um, let's say I'm still still touched with uh, the pandas. I still train with the pandas uh, as a win, but I'm you know getting a bit on the old side now, so I get a, get a bit too tired doing two sessions a, a weekend. So uh, but um, I enjoy okay. I enjoy the, I enjoy uh, what I'm doing with them, and hopefully. Uh, wave walkers will build up and there'll be a you know, there'll be a good 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 team to be in london um and they've, they've still got those excellent green paddles they've still got those green paddles the horrible color green oh, well there you go i think it's I'm sorry bro i'm sorry bro i don't like the color of those paddles they're horrible but hey they say if, it, if that's your, <laughs> your color then that's that's fine but it is it's, it's how they identify themselves and, and that's fine but yeah it's hard yeah. okay well i'll tell you what paul and that's that's nearly 40 minutes that's that's amazing and i'll tell you what, i'm gonna i'm gonna after this i'm gonna get some contact details for both windy pandas and for wave walkers because i'm sure i'm certain people will be watching this and may not even realize there's, there's, there's windy pandas going on down at lrc and wave walkers I, I, I myself i think i'm fairly well connected in dragon boating i knew about wave walkers i didn't know they were that didn't know you were working down with them or stuff and, and like i say you just, information needs to filter through and if we can do that through this this paddle shanties feature just get the word out and it's all about long form interviews so let me hold it there. I'll, I'll stop the recording now. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll talk just to you. Know, I just want to say one more thing before you do, Tim. I'm sorry. Okay. It's just also as well that I just recently taken on a, a, a team of um, 
Muslim ladies. Wow. Okay. No, talk about this, Nicole. This one on. That's great. <laughs> this is uh, this is another event. I mean, I'll, I'll be very very quick about this. No, no, no problem. No problem. Um, I have um, they, that's a, an, another brand new experience as well. That yeah. they they do a there's a come some kind of charity event that they do at Fairlock Waters. Um, it was supposed to be in June. I think because of the virus being put back. Yeah. Um, we got an email, same old thing really. The lady sent emails out to all the teams and then she said, you're the only one that came back to us, Paul. And um, so basically I started chatting to them and started working with them. And it's, yes, they, they come with everything on. The jabs, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and everything like that. And I, and I sort of said, you're going to have to look at, you know, it's jangling in the water, it's going to get heavy, it's going to get wet. I have to touch you, you know, I have to direct and move you and stuff like this. You understand these things. Um, again, it's a different way of working. Yes. It's a different way of working. It's a, it's a way of working. But, um, again, they, they come back for more. And they are really, really excited about taking part in the event. But, again, it's that competitive edge because last the, 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 the first year they did the event, they didn't get anywhere. Last year, uh, they came second. Um, wow. for the so this year they really want to push that so and they they really want to go for it now so they are very excited about it but what they're actually doing now they pull look can you tell me what kind of gear to wear and i sort of brought some leggings down and i bought some and i also sent them some i also gave them some pictures of the iranian dragon boat team i was going to say that yeah yeah because sonia's so, got a it's, she actually uses a night shirt but it's a it's a it's not quite a hijab but yeah. it covers all the, the modesty requirements. Absolutely. So enough. I said, look, this is what, and they said, look, we can't afford that. I said, well, look, you know, this is something to strive for. Um, again, but it's a, it's a different type of training to what I do with the breast cancer. Again, what you're saying, you know, you have to adjust, you have to, be, you have to adjust to the team, not the team adjust to you. Absolutely. Um, and um, yeah, so again, it's with them, but the exciting thing about it was, um, I mean, they do have a laugh with them. I mean, one time I think, just to finish it off here, though, is I. It was getting really, really hot, so I want to take my I'm taking my top off and what have you. I take my my hoodie off, and I took my hoodie off, and my whole my my my, my top came off as well. And I said, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And he said, no, that's okay, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not all prudes as you think they are and stuff I, like I that. I tell you what, I, I did a. I mean, well, I, when I was still in the police, I did a. Uh, it's called a mission. I did a, a year in Jordan. And I was interested that um, a lot of the ladies who went swimming down at um, Aqaba in the south of Jordan wore swimming hijabs, yeah? And the other thing is, a couple of years ago, I did something, it was at Bray Lake, I think, where I had, a same as you, a, a group of Muslim ladies who, it was scandalous that nobody was prepared to take them out. And it wasn't ignorance, it wasn't um, racism, it was fear. And what I mean by that is you always fear what you don't understand. Of course, these yeah. ladies turn up and you can't see the faces. And, and if you don't see beyond that and you can't see, it's just a, a religious garment. But they're ordinary human beings who can enjoy dragon boating as much as anybody else. And if you look beyond that, then, then you'll find a way where you'll make a reasonable adjustment. And most Maybe people, I was, in, I was in Israel recently and um, one of the ladies who's an Orthodox Jew, she said to me, we, everyone sort of has a hug at the end of a race. She says, I can't, and it's very, very, just, that's just the way it is. You know, you're not my husband, so I'm not going to hug you. But she was very nice about it. Of course, most people yeah. who, you don't really have to make the adjustment because people will understand mm. the, the social requirements and, and adjust for you. But I think all credit to you for doing that. And I'm really glad you mentioned that because that is yeah. such I mean, a... You're right, you're right, you're saying about the photographs. You take the yeah. photographs. They wanted team photographs. They wanted to be in it, but please don't put your arms around with us, you know, yeah. please don't. but that's fine. But they, they come out and say, look, and say, look, you need to tell me the do's and don'ts, please don't. But I need to tell you, if you want me to coach you, I have to do this. I have yeah. to touch you. I have to talk to you face to face. Yeah. I have to touch you on the shoulder. I have to, because sometimes, yeah. you know, yourself, when you're walking through the boat to adjust someone, you know, yeah. you <laughs> balance and all this sort of thing goes on. You, you have to do that. So, again, it's a, it's a, you're being up front with them. You're telling them up front, I will coach you, but I will have to do this, this, and this. You tell me what it is I'm, I should make sure that I don't do with you yeah. and what have you and, and stuff Brilliant. like that. So, I'm, so, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And that, that's, that's, 
That's because well, there you go. You see, so I thought I knew you quite well, and I didn't know you were doing this stuff with Wave Walkers, didn't I? And I'm really glad you told me. I mean, this this stuff as well. It's about, and I've got to say, it's, it's about getting the sport out to everyone. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, we keep on saying dragon boating's for everyone. Uh, you know, then what? We, it, I, it, does, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me if they, if anyone wants to get in the boat and they want to be trained and want to willing to learn, then uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do it. No no big deal. Okay, let, let's let's finish it there. But please promise me one thing. I know you're the CEO of Winnie Fans, but 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 a quality coach like you do not give up coaching. You know, you've got to carry on doing that because that 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 enlightening, that enthusiastic streak that you've got, your manner is is infectious, and, and people will respond to it. And it doesn't surprise me that you're coaching all these many various and diverse groups. Anyway, makes me think he was my good looks. Well, we had that as well. I was just coming on to that. But anyway, yeah. let, let, me, let me close it there. I'll, I'll carry on talking to you in a minute. But, but Paul, yeah. thank you very much. You've been, you've been, a, you've been nice a talking to you.